The time of adventure began, but at first war was nothing but play. The summer sun seared the rocks and forests of the Eiffel. Fields and pastures withered. The heathland crackled with dust and fire. Villages and hills flickered in the noonday heat, and dust from the troop exercise ground at Elsenbourne was scattered over gardens and roads. Morning mists blew over alders and birch saplings by the roadside. There was a sultry steaminess in evergreen and broad-leaved trees, and at eventide the shadows fell far across the land. Often not a leaf or stalk stirred, only the crickets fiddled a little somnolent music. Then coolness and silence blew soothingly abroad into the night. I had been a soldier for some months and now wore the warrior's mask with assurance, irony and patience. Never had substance and appearance been so far apart with me. Like a dream, obedience, commands and the toughness of service hushed past me, leaving not a trace. I withstood the training like a sleepwalker. I walked in step and carried my rifle. Like a machine, I learned how to use a machine gun and a light anti-tank gun. An hour's worth of reflection was enough to bring out the sadness and despair, emptiness and fear, rage and pain of my days. I did not complain about being alone. I loved it, but sometimes I was overcome by feelings of helplessness and abandon. Something inside me wanted me to remain as I had been before my draft. Even that became difficult. All thoughts of the future fled as from a huge horror, and I was barely able to overcome the shocks of the soldier's life. But I got used to it, to never being alone, but always a stranger among strangers, separated from the others by spirit and soul, manner of life and beliefs. I went through the inevitable acclimatization, but I never allowed the noise and the monotony of the day-to-day -day into my private kingdom. Before long, I had recovered the confidence and irony to get through it without taking damage. I lived in the dark. Ghosts lurked everywhere. Fear, disappointment and continual grief marked my sorry path. It was better then to believe in the most fleeting dreams than to be helplessly at the mercy of doubt and uncertainty. I couldn't live without the tiniest shimmer of hope. Everything on earth was growth and transformation, and as the surface changed, so the essence of a man ripened within. My dreams showed me pictures of my hidden evolution, even if I, dazzled by the days, was unable to understand them when, for a few seconds at a time, they showed themselves. I was asleep, but it was precisely at such moments that the reality and nobility of life struck me most forcibly. In this way, for all my errings, I was able to find my way back to the man I had been before the outbreak of war. Everything was a sort of homecoming to me, even if I often failed to grasp the path and the destiny, and at times I was able to shape my own life as I pleased. I was made happy by the small joys of a soldier's life, a book, a glass of wine, some music, and a contemplative evening in the Eiffel Mountains. Fate was often kinder to me than I expected and taught me to trust myself again. Barracks, life and drills seemed worse to me than war, just as the school of life took life more seriously than God and the world did themselves. Because now the metal that had been won from youth's ore was hammered to steel, and I had to serve as an anvil. The platoon was made into a fighting unit, the individual to a cog in a machine, able to fight, to overcome hardship, to suffer privation and to attack, willing to suffer and to die, prepared to obey and to do without for the sake of the war. And so the cannon fodder was brought up to snuff. The raw material was given its form, and I took the soldier's mask more seriously. I played my part in the great drama of assimilation, without any spectators on the stage of my destiny. The phoenix burned, and I gathered up its lost feathers. I had too much time to be able to think of myself. My existence took place within me, mostly unreflected in external events but the change was in progress. I was becoming a soldier. Mists like white smoke climbed out of the fields and meadows. I stood on sentry duty, feeling I was at the end of the world, in some foreign land, among foreign people. Evening came down out of a silver gate of clouds. The land subsided at my feet. 
Grass and shrub, near and far, slipped into shadow, haze and scent, and silence covered the earth once more. I set down my rifle and went looking for grasses and mosses. My boots grew wet with dew. I sniffed the fog and the chill of dusk, took off my steel helmet and let my hair blow in the wind. It stroked my forehead like tender hands. I was in love with every flower, every stone, and gave myself over to my looking and listening. The past few months had sharpened my eye for the beauty of small, simple, familiar things. I saw the world more alertly. The dust and grey of the city dropped from me, and I experienced the improbable beauty and delight of the world more than I ever had in the fullness and exuberance of the summers in Das. A flower by the roadside was a kindness to me, a forest under the scorching sun, a spider's web pearly with dew, a butterfly and the dance of midges at eventide, the plashing of a brook and a lizard sunning itself on a hot stone. All these were experiences to me. The growth of wheat, bindweed and poppy taught me to stand there with as much patience as theirs, and their innocence moved the masked man and soldier just as a repentant sinner might be moved by the comforting hand of an angel. But I was also painfully and burningly aware of the gulf that separated the dove, the shrub and the tree from the war, and the soldier from all the love and blessings of the earth. I was no longer jaded and indifferent, but found myself, like an insect with superfine antennae, shaken by the goodness and peaceableness of the earth. That was the only reason I was so grateful for the frost of early blue mornings, for daybreak and dawn chorus. It was as though, in my sorrow and cruelty, I had to be reminded of the divine. No evening seemed so mild to me as the dusk after a hot, exhausting day of misery and soldierly torment. I felt the star-bright nights, the rapture of moonlight, violent storms and tireless pattering rain more intensely than anything I had done by the sea. Also, the simplest facts of human life, sleep, a piece of bread, a sup of well water, a kindly word, all these, after long disregard, became precious to me once more, and anything beyond the minimum I took as an unmerited kindness. But that night I was taken by a violent yearning for my past. My sheltered youth pursued me with gorgeous scenes. There were many things I had not done, and the future sat in front of me like a raw block of marble. I could suddenly hear Moorish dances. I saw the stage, the dancers. I heard the gypsy song and the keening voices of the girls, the magic and drunkenness of Dionysiac music, and I wept for my homeland and my personal fate. I left nothing out, and as I drank the bitter cup, I saw the purpose and the significance of time. Scenes, music and stars wandered into my dreams. On the Hose Ven, the heathland was ablaze. The fire chewed the turf under the tindery ground and threatened woods and fields as it kept flickering up in new places. Foresters and soldiers were set to fight and quell it, and in the evening we were sent out to serve as firemen. Smoke obscured the slope. The smell of burning flowed down into the valley. Dust and ashes came down on our faces and shoulders. As the evening cooled, we climbed up. Dusk fell early. Smouldering fires played like will-o'-the-wisps on the forest edge. On a height, little flames flickered up like rows of lanterns, lit by dwarfs and heath spirits in the wind. We ate our bread, looked out a camping site for ourselves on the soft needles between the pines, put up a screen of branches to protect us from the wind, and rolled ourselves into our thin blankets. One man kept watch. Very slowly the humus gave back the warmth of the bygone day. I lay there a long time with eyes open. Stars glimmered in the branches, spun incredibly slowly over the trees. Wind whispered in the boughs. Dew fell and the earth exhaled mist and moisture. So I found my home in the cosmos. I had grass and needles for a bed, the sky for a ceiling. No walls separated me from God and the weft of life. I lay as sheltered as in the heart of the world. Some Walloon foresters came and sat by me. They talked about their work, their wives, 
about the work and the happiness of a conquered people that never understood the war and was happy simply to endure now that it was over. At midnight they took their leave of me, as of an old friend, and left to protect their huts from the creeping subterranean fire. I was glad. I never saw other peoples as enemies. There was always a bridge from man to man in quick time. They sensed the peaceable man under my uniform. The only enemies I ever found were around me and within me, in the self that was fighting against my destiny and imperiling me. So I thought and fell asleep. I woke shivering at dawn. The fire had gone out overnight, fog and smoke mixed to a thick haze. We went back down to camp. We travelled to Monschau, and I breathed in the air of my old city. Life wasn't so bad. It was just me making it unbearable for myself. As if, in my obstinate hatred for war and military, I insisted on suffering from them. At noon we marched past the lake at Robertsville, over hills and narrow forest paths into the valley. A stream flowed under beeches and alders, trout flashed over the stones, algae shimmied in the current, and feldspar and quartz glistered on the bottom. We climbed steep slopes to a ruin, and there in the ruined castle we set up camp among wild fruit trees and blossoming shrubbery. As evening fell, we scaled the wide tower, lit a campfire, and sat on the crumbling masonry amid ivy, brushwood, thorns and wild vines. We emptied a small barrel of beer, smoked, and sang songs of soldiers' lives, love, going to war and death, full of the melancholy beautiful bliss of death that I once felt when listening to Haydn's military symphony. Flames flickered, stars danced, shadows covered us, the scent of wood, juniper and mountain ash climbed up to us, the night wind burst on rock and bush, and the moon sailed through the dreamy night. The call of a screech owl resounded in our silence. We sat together as though resting from a long journey. In that hour I felt at ease in my company, one of many who shared the same destiny, the same garb. Though not necessarily of one mind, we were just adventurers abroad. So I was a soldier for a few hours at least, even in my heart, and felt an early intimation of gratitude to life and fate, which taught me that many things could happen only in war and in the mask of a soldier. I felt the soldierly spirit that identifies beauty in the midst of sweat and pain and welcomes the hour of relief at the end of obedience and punishment. Secretly, though, what I loved was the feeling of returning to myself, which opened its gates. What I was responding to were romance, youth and a whiff of a different freedom. Never weapons, never war. My yearning always remained awake, and my homesickness unrolled its carpets over all things and experiences. I was still only at the beginning, and what was ahead lay in front of me as in a locked chest. Untrodden, the wide, wide world stretched in front of me. I was still living in my own kingdom, thinking of the cosmos, the search for God, wild imaginings, dream and grotesquerie, which, even in self-division, spiritual anxiety, despair and questioning, I preferred to the soldierly world of masks. Night rain whooshed down on our tents, drumming on canvas and leaves. The following evening we marched back to Elsenborn. The war games went on. We practised with flags, blanks and dummies, and our victory was never in doubt. We tossed our enemy aside. And the Wehrmacht reports six carried nothing but victorious encirclements, advances, and extraordinary numbers of captives and booty from the Russian campaign, where our destiny was pushing us. We served the imperative of history as specks of dust in the whirlwind, and were privileged to participate in the end of our world. So the introduction to my adventures ended with intimations, dreams and signals, whose interpretation I left to some future date and later forgot. We returned to barracks in Cologne, lean and strong and sunburned. Our posting might arrive any day. I took what the city could offer me, amours, books, concerts, plays, variété and thoughtful hours in the cathedral. I went home, saw my friend once more and drank the night away with my comrades. Uncertainty and expectation were features of my days. 
I didn't worry and felt strangely impatient for what was to come. One day I found my name on the list. I was kitted out and equipped, said my goodbyes at home, and set off on my great Russian adventure. And so the war began for me as well. At dawn we marched to the station, with pack, steel helmet and rifle. It was raining, the weight pressed on our shoulders, and within us we felt the sadness of departure. The women on the streets had tears in their eyes. The girls smiled at us. We were put on trains, and the great adventure began. The train rumbled through the late summer into the rising sun. It felt humid in our goods wagon. We sat on hard, shaking benches. On the floor was a thin covering of well-trodden straw. Our baggage was stacked in the corners. Our blankets were full of dust and chaff. Rifles and belts struck the walls in the tempo of the rattling wagon, and the wheels sang the never-ending song of the rails. A hubbub of voices, song, card games, sleep and laughter surrounded me, and I was afraid to reflect. And so I read, without knowing what I was reading or understanding it. We hunkered down in the doorways and saw the villages, fields, woods and pastures of home slip past us, waved to the girls and sang our songs into the rushing wind. It wasn't much before midnight that we finally fell asleep on the boards, shaken about in our carriage pursued by dreams, and we woke not long after. It seemed to have barely gotten dark at all. For a long time I looked at the flat meadowland with its half-timmered houses and scattered groups of trees. Sometimes the scenery reminded me of the Dars, towns and empty expanses rolled by. We kept seeing birch trees beside the line, and yarrow, Aaron's rod, and grass bending in the wind as we passed. The same little wood seemed to come round again, the solitary tree, the field track, the road, the stream. The aspect of the landscape was slow to change. I was indifferent to the noise and commotion of the soldiers in the wagon with me. I was quiet and calm, oddly equable. When I looked at the ordinary people outside, working in their fields and gardens, I remembered that I was travelling to Russia to fight to destroy seed and harvest, to be a slave of the war. But then, out of danger and nearness of death, I would feel a lofty freedom and an almost pleasurable sense of life. I was overcome by homesickness. Sorrow at parting and loneliness made me sad, and of course I was frightened of what lay ahead. Certainly there was nothing familiar. In spite of that, I wasn't wrestling with my fate. I yearned with a passionate impatience for whatever was awaiting me. I was still young enough to desire anything new, to relish the excitement of the journey, and to intoxicate myself with dreams and fantasies. I didn't think much of death and danger. Distance pulled me toward it. The array of what I saw outside and the atmosphere of our departure filled me with an unspecified joy. Melancholy recollections mingled with stoicism toward the present, worry and grief with a boisterous pleasure in being alive. I felt as unhappy and consumed by bliss as if I were in love. And so I entered the magical space of adventures. It was the beginning of a long journey. The next night also passed without sleep. It was very early in the morning when we crossed the border into conquered and once more partitioned Poland. Flat country and distant hills characterised the sparse scenery. Stubble fields with shocks of corn, pastures with the drying hay from the last mowing of the year, small villages and low functional houses, wide streets and neglected gardens filled in the space between the cities. Lod, Krakow, Katowice. Barefoot women went about their work, with kerchiefs tied over their dark hair, and skirts bleached to some indistinguishable colour by the sun. Ragged, neglected children begged for bread. They ran along beside the train, holding out their bony hands, or stood there accusingly, an image of hunger and abject poverty. Their pleas and their thanks sounded equally foreign to my ear. We had little enough to eat for ourselves. Their poverty was strange to us too. It didn't resemble our native poverty in Germany and we didn't really understand it. We were not yet acquainted with hunger and inflation. 
It was our first meeting with a people who spoke a different language, with a different attitude, another purpose. I saw no enemies, only conquered people, only strangers. No path led to their souls and spirits, and from the moving train I had little sense of their day-to-day -day existences, their happiness and their grief. I did nothing and didn't reproach myself. I was just tired, pale, and I dropped off from time to time. We stopped in Krakow. At midnight I was standing sentry on the rails. Over me sparkled innumerable pallid stars. A yellow moon appeared between loose clouds, turned a deep orange and sank in a gory red. Barely a signal, barely a faraway light shone to me in the dark. I shivered and my eyes were dropping shut. We travelled onward. In the morning we reached Jaroslau, the new frontier town on the San. We piled out. September soon lay on the platform of the little station. The Russian Empire began on the far side of the river. I sat down on a stack of boards, felt the warm sun in a tired way, and watched Russian POWs at work. Bearded faces, unkempt hair, empty eyes, and ripped uniforms all presented an image of sorry homelessness. Every movement that was performed was dull and slothful, and the guards swore and hit out with sticks and rifle butts. I felt no anger at the ill treatment of these helpless men, and no sympathy either. I saw only their laziness and their obstinacy. I didn't know yet that they were hungry. I was glad we had stopped moving for the moment, and that we had another interval of time. I was completely preoccupied with my own destiny. We picked up our knapsacks and marched to the barracks. Ochre houses with lofty windows behind dusty trees were redolent of an atmosphere of soldiery, service and ugliness. We moved into bleak little rooms with cockroaches, dust and hunger. There our shared privation and distance from home made us into comrades. Secretly, though, everyone remained isolated. There were no bridges from one man to the next. We marched out every day with knapsack, coat and blanket roll, with storm pack, bread sack and rifle. Singing, we marched through Yaroslaw and followed the tarred roads into the outlying woods and hills. With singing and humour, we battled through our exhaustion. We had to practice marching because at the time that was the only task we expected to be given during this war. We marched in rain and shine and thunderstorms broke over our heads. We draped canvas sheeting about us. The wet dripped off our helmets, and our rifles sprouted rust like fungus. I didn't often go into town in the evenings. It wasn't that it was strange to me, the towns of this world aren't so very different, and at that time I didn't have much of an eye for fine distinctions. It was a wretched caricature of a small town in Germany, without any amenities except a little library and a tolerable schnapps in some of the bars. I didn't enjoy being a soldier among a conquered people. I felt strange and excluded. I felt ashamed of my presence there and often felt responsible for the people's misery as when an unmerited hatred seemed to strike at me from all directions. I bought cake and fruit to supplement the sparse diet, sometimes played the piano or read in the soldiers' quarters, where we had a wildly varied selection at our disposal. Then I would return home at night with my companions through the darkened town. We sat in smoky bars and drank the garish and syrupy schnapps. Later on, we would stare at girls and women, but there were no encounters. I wasn't immune to the tender blonde or gypsyish charms of Polish women, but I was too ashamed to go after love in the midst of this foreign people, and the squalid brothels only disgusted me. Eros took other paths in our jokes, and everyone who told stories became his own Don Juan or Casanova. Only self-restraint and collective living could master what lay ahead of us, and so we lived like monks. Usually I was on my own in the barracks reading room, and I wrote my letters, aphorisms and poems, and tried my hand at eerie tales. From my fables and fantasies I increasingly withdrew to philosophy and problems. Often serious conversations would go on till deep in the night. We were looking for some principle or backbone to help us bear our fate. Every day the tormenting emptiness within me deepened, like the grief of a homesick child.
while at the same time I ate the bread of what was to come and painted frescoes of my future. I was a soldier in the same way I had once worked in a bank. I accepted my lot like a job I disliked, and so saved myself some mental strife. At first every adjustment was difficult, but my spirit remained true to itself, and what I experienced wasn't wasted. But what I gained, the future had to confirm. I came to my senses more and more, and left to my own devices like a shipwrecked man on an island, I became ever more thoughtful and introspective during my solitary hours. Broad awake, I stalked through the days of incipient destiny and soul, making. When the autumn wind bent the yellowing trees, when red foliage flew and the storm blew over the hills, when rain clouds chased in front of the sun and the distance expanded under the changeable skies, I felt again that heightened feeling of intoxication that once had been engendered by my summers on Das. Now my yearning for those free times of wandering and growth became part of what I felt, a yearning for a return to the familiar beauties of a world more my own. Every fine hour deepened me, homeless, all on my own in the foreign place, landscape, tree and shrub all acquired deeper meaning and fresh purpose. My senses became acuter, I looked more consciously and tenaciously than I had before for what was great and enrapturing, and I kept coming across wonders and creations that made the separation easier for me to bear. An enigmatic whiff of the East, an atmosphere of barrenness, sadness and hunger over objects and vistas gave the landscape a more potent force, and dreams and intimations supplemented the strange reality. Away in the East, the advance was continuing. That was all we were told. In spite of that, our lives were changing too, and while wartime existence might make us sceptical about our souls, we were trying to adopt attitudes, masks and postures that would be equal to the demands and conditions of what lay ahead. So each of us went within himself in his own way and mastered step by step his preparation. At first there was the primordial circling around God, but the idea of God paled against the promise of destiny. I didn't want to be a weakling and lean against his omnipresence in my fear and need, not leave my happiness and sorrow in his fatherly hands, accept my lot as punishment and mercy, and console myself with his sacraments and promises. With rare logic, I didn't want to recognise any commands that, as a soldier, I would be unable to observe, and I told myself even then that I wasn't responsible for anything that I lived, thought or said as a soldier, whether it was wisdom, experience, love or death. My cosmos was now populated by angels and demons, and Jesus to me became more and more a prophet and less and less the Son of God. But in a world without God, there had to be new forces that determined my standpoint and rooted my spiritual life. The shivers of preparation blew through me, and all unknowing I stepped into a heroic nihilism. Or so I thought. Life was suffering. Death ruled the world. After the pain of birth, man's path led through sweat, anxiety, grief, fear and hunger. Death was the only release. It took destruction to restore freedom and peace. It was a terrible thing to live in this world in meaninglessness, viciousness and godlessness. Better, as the Greeks said, never to have been born. The flood and the end of the world were the only consolation. Destruction was the final task of the seer and expert of our age. The last gods still needed to be forgotten. The idols smashed, love eradicated, procreation foiled and life concluded. Ruins, dirt and ashes should lie there as plainly visible as they had long secretly been forming the picture of the world. But to the living, it was not only a matter of being in this void without metaphysical shelter, in doom and dread, bitter irony and dance of death, laughter and torture. It was tolerating its frightfulness, and also to want this fiendish life as it was, to take it as it came, and to love it in its barren bitterness and corruption, to call it beautiful, and to live it powerfully to the end to find pride in its gruesomeness, delight in its decay, enthusiasm in its devastation, to deepen the worst horror with one's intellect, 
to live consciously and die coolly, at one with a reviled fate. There was merely the brazen, inexorable necessity, Ananke, going her ways, over men and times as over grass and sand, grinding everything under her heel, and at the same time alerting it all to a meaningless and godless existence. She tossed the church and the atom on a pair of scales, despised God and glorified death, and still bore fruitful blossoms in her soul, nightshade growth of time. Only war could breed these thoughts, and they remained there, through all its phases and guises. In every crisis, it is to them the adventurer returns. From their humus his inner fate nourishes itself. My circling around God became an erring around death and void. There was no other way. I hoped and I carried my stars, but they shone with a different light. That was the spirit in which I wanted to go to war. I loved life because it was cruel in its beauty, appalling in its goodness, deadly in its fruitfulness, because our existence was a tragedy. Birth, condemnation and death were a liberating curse. I demanded roughness and danger to test myself in, a day full of toil and bitterness in which to purify myself. What I wanted was a transformation beyond consolation, dream and refuge with God. And I found my pride and my greatness in wanting this carnival of killing and burning just exactly as it was, and to love it and to stand in it without illusion, support or belief. To laugh into the void and still be there, in the criminal pleasure of being cut adrift from gods and angels. I wanted despair for myself, and wounds, that I might survive them, and I felt strong enough to take up the fight with scorn, hunger and rage. And perhaps all that was just the demented mask of man, who in the limbo of his destiny finds himself breaking down. I was given all the things I dreamed of, but I did not pass their test. I still needed to ripen to my fate. The Indian summer faded away, autumn arrived, and the levels of the sand rose. The bridge at Jaroslaw, dynamited during the fighting against Poland and now half repaired, was at risk. The river tore away supports and embankments, beams washed down the stream, the levee was undermined and parts of it were collapsing. We marched there in a fine rain, to salvage lumber, support what was still standing, and keep watch on the levee. On the horizon, Yaroslaw disappeared in haze and rain dust. Meadows, sodden pastures, groups of trees and huts passed by. We reached the river at noon. Storm clouds, darkness and rainbows menaced to the west. Colourless sunshine trickled down onto the fields. The broad grassy banks had disappeared under a murk of clay-coloured and dirty grey water. Only bushes stuck out, collecting scummy bubbles in the mesh of their twigs. The spirit of the eastern landscape wafted toward us, melancholy, emptiness, expanse, a twilight mood, and as if to order, the remnants of the bridge obtruded into the oppressive scene of abandon and strangeness. Now I knew how far away I was from home. An unwelcoming country took me in, where I could not live, only die, or, like a Hasuerus, wander forever, a drifter, evicted, a ghostly shadow, an exile, wafted about by the choirs of the dead and the night wind off the hills, consumed by spirits and as lonely as at the edge of the world. The only way a man could live here was in tents, take them down, set them up, take them down again, always on the road in no man's land and only the grave would set an end to yearning and suffering, fear and abandonment. Any notion of becoming had to be a grave error here. There was no adventure, no romance, not here. Only the year governed with its wheel of perpetual return. The soul lost its features, the wanderer his mask and his face. And so I entered the domain of my new life, staggering from one contradiction to the next. We got to work. From barges and rafts we laid new foundations, attached drifting timbers, anchored what was left of the props, spanned wires and dragged earth and stones into the dikes. We scooted fearlessly around in the rapids, whirlpools and foam. And by evening the bridge had been saved. Railwaymen played host to us, and for the first time in a while we ate our fill. 
The moon dipped land and water in its unreal light, and I breathed in the cool air as a portent of a better, finer life to come. My notions of the future expanded. I had intimations and dreams. I felt curiosity, an appetite for novelty, for the strange and extraordinary, which kept returning and pulling life forward. Panic alternated with a bizarre pleasure in everything that went against me and seemed to mock me. I wanted the plum opposite, the improbable, the impossible that didn't belong to me, and in this desire marked the beginning of the view by which everything was pure adventure in either thought or experience. I drifted. I had let myself drop into the stream, and now I was waiting to see which plank would come along and rescue me, which skiff would pick me up, which coast would permit me to land. I referred to this as my passive adventurism, getting tangled up in dangerous and dicey situations and waiting to see how the knot might be unpicked. Uncertainty, unfamiliarity, the imminent, the untrodden, refused to allow any durable form to appear. A state of readiness was the most that might be expected. New orders came and we travelled on. I wasn't sorry to take my leave of the limbo, the way station of Jaroslaw. Monotonous, mournfully beautiful country went past. Indian summer baked the fields, veils of trees and shrubs flamed in russet glory, and the grass withered. The sun rose in infinite silence and loneliness over seas of fog. Scattered farmhouses loomed up out of the distance, ruined bridges and houses told of the progress of the war. The fields ran on endlessly. Villages stretched along the hills. Children minded the farm animals. Roads led away into the distance, straight, straight, straight. Autumn dropped ever sadder colours onto the melancholy palette. Villages looked deserted, people like dream figures in a shadowy existence, as if, though long dead, they were still doing their work under some mystical compulsion. We got off at Fastoff. I said goodbye to the train and to everything I had ever known. The candle had burned down to a stump. It was like saying goodbye to life itself. Russian passion, Russia. Now the war began for us as well, and it was as though we were merely the latest to be involved in the ongoing crucifixion of Russia and its people. We saw only women and old people. The men had fled or gone into hiding. But even if we didn't believe everything the muzhiks told us, we knew, and we could see for ourselves and hear it and feel it wherever we went, that this people of so many mingled races had always suffered, that all through history its roads had been a via crucis that hadn't even merited a martyr's crown. Nor did we either, because we were cowardly before the law. Not only self-division, despair, humiliation, brutality, abjectness, rue and bruising, as the poets say, constituted this suffering. The peasant, in his poverty, in misery, degeneration and slothful passivity, was condemned to idiocy and servitude. He bore his mute animal suffering under the Tsar, the knout of the landowner, and in the collective farm. He suffered from the climate, was duped, beaten, was raw material, learned to be cunning and cruel himself, and still suffered on into eternity. He stood on the bridge between Asia and Europe, in the twilight, on the everlasting Good Friday, and a hundred generations had only one face among them. We saw the hunger and the misery, and under the compulsion of war we added to it. The passion took us into its territory. We marched. Fastov. A vast plain unfolded outside the railway station, and the paved road led dead straight over low hills and fields. Straight, dead straight, that was the theme of Russia. Fields, corn stubble and meadows slid past, only very rarely a tree or a house on the horizon. The sun glared, dust whirled up. We carried our packs and rifles and marched in loose file under their weight. At the very first rest stop, we sprawled onto the dusty grass at the side of the road, staggered up on the command to continue marching, and dragged ourselves onward. I started to fall behind. As evening fell, I would pass comrades insensible on the roadside, felled by heat stroke or exhaustion. A little troop of us moved into a village, were allocated a barn, and lay down. 
We couldn't eat, barely drank, and slept in leaden fatigue. In the morning, trucks came and saved us the agonising march. We rode to Kiev, were put with regiments of the 95th Infantry Division, the 14th Company of the 279th Infantry Regiment. And there I remained for the war. There my road began into the Russian passion. We spent one more night in Kiev. In the morning, before it was light, we set out and stood shivering on the road. For a long time, progress was stalled at the bridge over the Dnieper. A keen wind blew off the river. Finally, our columns moved across. Horses pulled the artillery pieces. A munitions cart with blankets and equipment, knapsacks and booty, travelled with each light anti-tank gun. At noon, while we rested, the field kitchen drove past the ranks and gave out food. The supply column was a long way back. The front was an unknown distance ahead. We heard that our motorised units were pursuing the Russians. That was all we knew, no names of places or directions. At night we set up tents or slept in houses, lying on straw and always tired. Slowly but irresistibly we moved across the steppe toward the great adventure. Sun seared, dust and sweat begrimed our faces, and the march and the road seemed never-ending. Low whitewashed cottages stood among fruit trees and wells all of it lost in infinitude. Women in brightly coloured headscarfs stood barefoot on the broad road, beautiful figures among them. We saw hardly any men. We marched, our feet swelled up and hurt, our breaths came quicker and shallower till we were allowed to rest. Every night was a relief. I felt an utter stranger in Russia. We were given a day's respite. A white village in the midst of apples and poplars took us in. We could wash and sleep, wash our clothes, and fix something to eat with stolen eggs and flour. There were occasional beautiful simple houses standing in the bare landscape. But mostly they were squat, ugly huts, in which four or six or ten people lived in a single small, low-ceilinged room. They were beam constructions, with daub walls, the cracks stuffed with moss, the inside roughly painted, the outside generally not. Their roofs were straw. A stamped earthen floor supported the great stove on which the inhabitants slept. Mice rustled in the straw and dust. There was a bench, a table, and occasionally a bed or pallet by the stove. Underneath it quivered rabbits, pigs, and the vermin that would attack us. Bedbugs bothered us at night, fleas broke our rest, and lice multiplied in our uniforms. Spiders, flies, woodlice and cockroaches scuttled over the tables and over our faces and hands. The illumination was provided by an oil lamp. Sometimes, after our arrival, the women would have lit the candle in front of the icon and pulled a Bible out of its hiding place and laid it on a little corner table with artificial flowers. Above it were pictures of the Madonna and various saints, prints mounted on gold paper and framed in wooden boxes. Some of the women wore crosses on chains around their necks and crossed themselves before meals. Otherwise they passed their time in sleep and idleness. The winter was empty and there was little to do in the autumn. They lived on potatoes and sour black bread, usually kept a few chickens or geese, sometimes a pig or a cow. But they were strong and healthy. This was what they were used to, this was their life from day to day, and neglect, squalor and poverty bothered them little. We marched on, rain streamed down, we slithered over grass and clay, and the roads turned to bog. Snow and hail were carried on the wind. Winter set in at the beginning of October. The roads were bottomless, and we marched on from village to village. In Glukov we stopped for a day, we slept in Kutok, and yet we had no idea where we were. Fate drove us on and we didn't know where we were going till we got there. We were not called upon to fight, the enemy was still far distant, but the march alone was sufficiently bitter for us. We crept on through the mud, our artillery pieces and munitions carts bogged down, the horses broke down, were barely capable of pulling light loads. The supply column was delayed, we were no longer victualled. One after another the horses collapsed and died, or had to be put out of their misery. 
We replaced them with tougher Russian ponies, which we managed to capture wild or took away from collective farms. They in turn starved, became scrawny and weak. The bones stuck out of their worn, untended hides. Our coats and blankets grew wet and mouldy, had clumps of clay on them, and we could no longer get our sodden boots off our swollen, inflamed feet. The dirt and the lice gave us sores, but we marched, stumbling, reeling, pushed the carts out of the muck and tramped on dully through showers of rain, sleet and occasional night frosts. Finally, there was a little forest after the desolate plain, a few pines, beeches, alder scrub, not more. Beyond it, the flat expanse began again. We spent the night with farmers who had been German prisoners in World War I. They were friendly and hospitable and complained about the new age in their country. But we could not make any comparisons. Frost-reddened maples and lofty birches with their last yellow leaves stood in a dusting of snow. We hardly saw the beauty of the enchanting scenes. We were hungry. The cooks slaughtered cattle and pigs on the way and requisitioned peas, beans and cucumbers everywhere. But a little midday soup wasn't enough to get us through our exertions. So we started taking the last piece of bread from women and children, had chickens and geese prepared for us, pocketed their small supplies of butter and lard, weighed down our vehicles with flitches of bacon and flour from the larders, drank the over-rich milk and cooked and roasted on their stoves, stole honey from the collective farms, came upon stashes of eggs and weren't bothered by tears, hand-wringings and curses. We were the victors. War excused our thefts, encouraged cruelty, and the need to survive didn't go around getting permission from conscience. Women and children were made to go to the wells for us, water our horses, watch our fires and peel our potatoes. We used their straw for our horses or for bedding for ourselves, or else we drove them out of their beds and stretched out on their stoves. The country started to get hilly. The villages got still more wretched and the mud got worse. Men and horses were at the end of their strength. The trucks and tanks of the lead units got stuck in the mire. The advance faltered. We moved into a village and rested. Slowly we recovered. We suffered from diarrhoea. Our bellies were a ferment of swamp. We were disgusted and appalled, but we couldn't fast. Hunger hurt too much. We moved in semi-permanently. We drove the women out of their homes and pushed them into the most wretched of the dwellings. Pregnant or blind, they all had to go. Crippled children we shooed out into the rain, and some were left with nothing better than a barn or shed where they lay down with our horses. We cleaned the rooms and heated them, and looked after ourselves. We always managed to find potatoes, fat and bread. We smoked makorka, the heavy Russian tobacco. Otherwise we lived as well as we could and didn't think about the deprivation that would come after us. Kosma Molemianskoye was the name of the village. I fell into homesickness and pining. The extent of my life and thoughts never got beyond tiredness, fantasies of desertion, need for sleep, hunger and cold. My star went on its predestined way. Beyond all love, I drifted in my Russian passion. That I had once walked by the sea in a storm, that I had lived and dreamed, that seemed itself like a dream. I would give up God and my own humanity for a piece of bread. I had no comrades. Everyone fended for himself, hated anyone who found better booty than himself, wouldn't share, would only trade, and tried to get the better of the other. There was no conversation beyond the day to day. The weaker was exploited, the helpless left in his misery. I was deeply disappointed, but then I too had become hard. We froze. At first there was a thin layer of snow on the road, but as it grew colder the paths slowly became firmer. We were able to start marching again. At Fatesh there was a thaw, and we were knee-deep in the soft sludge again. Then we froze but there was no winter clothing to be had. Any woolen garments we found became ours. Blankets, scarfs, pullovers, shirts, and especially gloves we made off with at any opportunity. We pulled the boots off the old men and women on the street if ours were wanting. The torture of the marches embittered us to the point that we became impervious to the sufferings of others. We showed off our ill-gotten gains, 
and with the impression we made with a pistol on a defenceless woman, who by ill fortune was a Russian. We were oblivious to the way we were often given food when we set foot in a hut, to the peasants giving us their makorka to smoke, a woman freely offering us a couple of eggs, or a girl sharing her milk with us. We still dug around in every corner, even if we let what we had taken just go bad later. We didn't want it. It was a sort of compulsion. Our commands kept telling us that we were the lords of the universe in a conquered country. We had to go on. The front was still far off. No one asked us how we did it. Our legs ran with pus. The socks rotted on our feet. Lice owned us. We were cold, hungry, ill with diarrhoea, scabies, diphtheria, jaundice and kidney infections. We dragged ourselves forward on sticks, rode bareback on horses, or gripped the sides of carts with frozen fingers, but we marched on. Another village, another one of the innumerable villages we saw, and whose names we heard only to forget them immediately afterward. We got there in the dark and slept in a barn. A stove burned, but it gave no warmth. The straw was wet, our coats and boots were heavy. We lay down, freezing trembling with cold exhaustion and rage. In the morning we moved into a house where an infant had just died. The women were wailing over the small white corpse in a long, drawn-out, free-form lament. The father kissed the bare hands, the bloodless lips. They were weeping, but they gave us their hospitality freely and kindly. There was no doctor anywhere about, so I wrote out the death certificate. The old farmer thanked me. He talked about his life, long years as a prisoner in Siberia, in chains, the bitter cold, with forced labour and beatings. We never learned what his crime had been. Nothing but humility and kindness shone from his pale blue eyes. The carpenter put together the coffin from unfinished boards in the yard. The women, singing again, dressed the boy in his Sunday best, bedded him on hay, pressed a cross nailed together from a couple of sticks in his folded hands. They buried the coffin in their garden. No cross marked it, just a brown tump in the bleak landscape. Parents, brothers and sisters, and friends ate a chicken for a funeral feast. One was cooked for us as well. The hospitality was extraordinary. We didn't deserve it. Kursk. We barely saw it. We did nothing but go through the buildings for food and woolen garments. Working Russian prisoners we stole bundles and tobacco from. We smoked greedily and at last lay down warm and peaceful. In a village beyond Kursk we had more peace. A tiny consignment of winter clothing, blankets and headgear, a few gloves arrived. It was in Budonovka. Reports reached us of fighting close at hand. We were almost at the front. We set up sentries in the snowy country and bitter cold, and some had their feet frozen. But we got mail, and in the quiet, our thoughts concentrated on our own lives. I read and wrote. I watched the sun rise and set over the snow. At night, we kept vigils in the house. Outside, the frost jingled, the north wind went howling around the house, and the snow glittered under the stars. Then snow started falling again and covered the plain higher and denser. Everything in me became quiet. The firs loomed blackly on the railway embankment, and the land shone white and bluish-brown in the moonlight. Meteorites fell. But sometimes I would again be seized by apathy. We were passive, without hope, without belief and refuge, and even the war seemed empty to us. Simple things retained their value, but everything great became an irrelevance to us. A stern, cruel necessity made us into the people the time required. A patrol encountered the enemy. We set out, and with orders to take Shigri, we left our Russian passion and went into winter warfare. We received our baptism of fire. For the first time we heard the whistling of mortars, the whipping of machine-gun bursts, the wild, shrilling and bright, brutal crash of shells. And it wasn't a game except for burned-down villages, hulks of tanks, graves, and the fires of Kursk on the rim of the sky, we hadn't seen anything of the real war. But even then, our faces had sometimes turned to stone. Now, though, we saw men fall, saw blood and wounds, 
and we carried our rifles in our hands and fired them blindly into the empty space in front of us. On the first day of the offensive, we attacked a village. The remaining Russian defenders quickly withdrew. On the way, I lost contact with my men. We left our vehicles at the edge of a ravine and found soldiers sitting in the snow, weeping. They had frozen feet but still had to go on. A horse fell and I led it. Finally, I found the advance route and followed the footprints into the village, sat down freezing in a house and was brought food. I didn't know there were Russian soldiers sleeping only a few houses away, who were woken by the shots of the attackers, which roused me as well. The next morning we came under fire from a column of tanks and had to bury our heads in the snow. A yelled prayer went up to us to keep our discipline. We weren't praying for our lives. We called out for courage, to keep us strong and proud, and save us from cowardice. Cowardice was worse than death, and even a peaceable fellow like me despised anyone who trembled for his life and sought to avoid ruin. I loved to prove myself in danger. That was the ultimate meaning of those times. And in that chaos of primal fear and dread, the soul could come up with nothing but this final echo of childhood. Our guns made no impression on the steel monster, but it still withdrew in the evening with the Russian troops. Around midnight, we marched past burning farmhouses and smoking huts to a short, exhausted sleep in a village. One soldier forced his way into a farmhouse, and the farmer set bread and milk before the hungry man. But the soldier wanted more. He wanted honey, which he soon found, and flour and lard. The farmer beseeched him, his wife cried, and in their fear of starving, the couple tried to wrest his booty away from him. The soldier smashed in the farmer's skull, shot the farmer's wife, and furiously torched the place. He fell that same night, hit by a stray bullet. But we shouldn't ask after God's justice in war. On the next day, the Russians put up fierce resistance. We had to fight every step of the way. I remained behind with a machine gun, guarding the supply column and the spare munitions against stray attackers. We spent endless hours in the ice and snow, with no protection against the biting wind, eating frozen honey from the comb, as we didn't have bread or water. We soon lost all feeling in our feet. Some suffered frozen toes, ears and hands if they were carrying munitions chests and failed to notice the blood stopping in their hands, or were forced to lie motionless in the snow for hours while enemy fire shrilled over their heads. We were bitter and irritable, and then dull and indifferent. At last we moved off. A small hamlet had been conquered, but the Russians had burned it all down before leaving. We looked out bundles of straw, spread them out in a hollow, laid canvas over them, crept completely under our blankets, and pressed ourselves together. We slept in spite of our icy feet. But whoever went out on sentry duty didn't dare lie down afterward, because their foreheads were already sore, and some showed signs of frostbite. We lit big fires, staggered and hopped around the flames, and waited for day to break. The night was the colour of blood, from the fires in the villages around, and the hills echoed darkly with the thunder of explosions. These experiences made me feel a stranger to myself. The order came to strike camp. We marched towards Shigri and took the first heights without having seen a single Russian. Again I stayed behind with a machine gun and a couple of comrades since we were unable to keep up, enfeebled as we were by diarrhoea and exhaustion. From up on the slopes we saw the little town in the valley and rows of houses on the hills around. We lay in the snow with some men from another platoon. Sporadic fire from Russian infantry weapons blew over our heads. We might be hit at any moment. We were forced to wait it out, unmoving, inert, unresisting dead material. Suddenly one of us leaped up. No one had given any order. But we followed him, breathing easily again, once more conscious of our being there, not brave but in a frenzy, done in by inactivity and waiting, driven by cold into a panic of movement, courageous out of a fear of keeping still, and then suddenly transported by a blinding access of enthusiasm. Death and danger were forgotten. Life was justified by mere action. Men fell. The wounded screamed. We didn't pay them any regard. 
We charged like maniacs to the edge of the town. We didn't throw ourselves to the ground, not even when the machine gun bullets whistled so close by us that we could feel them. The defenders were gunned down mercilessly, and whatever we saw of honey, fat, sugar and good bread was hurriedly stowed away, while next door a brief firefight was still in progress, and our comrades were being slain. The Russians fled. As night fell, we moved past burning factories and silos into Shchigri. Bridges burned and crashed. Mortars continued to fire at us. We didn't care. We lay down in a house, not bothering with sentries, and slept as though comatose. The next day we looked at the wreckage. Debris, bricks, glass and charred beams lay all over the road. Ruins everywhere. We declared a few days' rest. Simple people were kind and hospitable to us that first night. They washed our shirts, brought out pillows and blankets for us to sleep on. We let it happen, gave ourselves to them in a limitless display of trust, and went around as in a dream. When we thought back to the fighting, we felt an unstable mixture of horror and disappointment. Fighting, danger and nearness of death seemed to us like a dream of the inadequacy of war. It wasn't sufficiently shaking and enthusing, yet horror grinned at us from all around. We didn't know whether we had been hoping for a long siege, whether the swift victory offended us, or whether a secret horror informed us that it would have been better for us if we had died or been wounded. It wasn't the battle that caused the suffering, but the vicious cold, the helpless waiting around. Then, as if coming to our senses, we suddenly grasped the meanness all around us of dying and having to kill. At that time I still got over things quickly. Individual details went under in a vast ocean of apathy and oppression and never took shape. We moved in with a couple of young women whom we called the Daughters of the World Revolution, who impressed us with their pride and their comradely attitude. It was as though they sensed a tie between us as coevals, some shared quality in our yearning and our fate that was stronger than the division between us that the war wrought. Strangely, there was an intimation here of a greater peace than any war could ever bring. With our looted bread and honey and their chickens and potatoes, we prepared a common feast and talked in a blithe mixture of languages. Our last evening in Shigri we spent with a landowning family, who were hanging on in a dismally converted building and had nothing left to remind them of pre-revolutionary times beyond a photograph album. The old man, an upright, strong and good-looking patriarch, brought in his daughters, simple, delicate girls who came in holding hands as if to comfort one another in a dehumanised world and thus cling to some paradisal youth. He began with an ironic rendition of the Internationale and followed it with a teary version of the Tsar's hymn, the Stenka Razine, and some hymns. I spoke French with his wife. She spoke in low, shy tones. Her face was still beautiful, but marked by suffering. I got to hear of the expropriation of landowners, of various forms of forced labour and increasing hardship. One son was in Siberia, another had been killed. The fate of a daughter married in Odessa remained unknown. We felt sorry for them. We did not yet understand that a new spirit and new growth were bound to trample on the precious things of the past. Then we marched on to the assembly point on the River Tim. Many were sick, all were exhausted, and the marches in increasing cold became more arduous by the day. And now we were marching into the unknown. We crossed the small frozen river, barely restored, then endless marches across frozen snow in icy winds under the full moon toward Volovo. Our objective was Voronezh. We never got there. The day before we were to take Volovo, I overslept, along with a couple of comrades. No one woke us. Everyone thought only of himself and his own hunger and exhaustion and the implacable orders that forced him to march on. The three of us followed the footprints across the featureless, measureless plain. We encountered Russian soldiers who threw their guns down in the snow. We did nothing to them as our uncertainty grew, 
and our strange lostness. In one village we saw Russian troops resting with their horses, watching us through their binoculars, but they didn't shoot at us and seemed at pains to give the impression of being prisoners. And so we marched on, the very last stragglers, through Russian forces readying themselves for a counter-strike to encircle our own rash undertaking. That night we came to a village where we found our own unit again. The soldiers squeezed out onto the jam-packed streets, horses and trucks, guns and carts, bunched together on the retreat from the first failed assault on Volvo. We never learned the name of the village, but no one forgot the place, and everyone knew what was meant by Nikolausdorf. After midnight, just as we were getting off to sleep and feeling a little warmer, mounted Cossacks stormed through the village. They tossed hand grenades into the houses and were gone as soon as the alarm was given. That night there were eight soldiers asleep in a house off on its own on the edge of the village that the Cossacks surrounded. They woke to the danger. Two of them jumped through the windows and died, each hit by several bullets. Two others sleepily got up as the Russians forced their way in and were mowed down. Two more were taken prisoner in the hallway and were made to join the Cossacks in towing away the captured guns and to use them on us for months to come. One was up in the hayloft and got off with a nervous collapse. The last was hidden behind a cupboard. The Russians lit the room with matches but failed to see him. He too went mad, started running off back west and was picked up in Riga as he was getting on a goods train there. No one could understand how he had gotten so far and he was no longer able to give any sort of account of it himself. The following morning a soldier doled out boxes of hand grenades among a hundred captured Russian prisoners and shot the survivors with his submachine gun. We took up a decoy position outside Volovo, while another section conducted the actual assault. We peppered the nests of resistance with all the light and heavy infantry weapons we had, but the Russians didn't give an inch. We knelt or lay in the snow, our knees froze fast to the ground, ice formed between our coats and our tunics. We stamped on the ground to get feeling back in our feet. The men's skin froze onto the metal of their rifles because few had usable gloves. Bleeding scraps were torn off their hands, which froze over before the blood could flow. Many froze to death and many others ran off in despair. Even on our way here there had been casualties, and now the numbers of dead and wounded climbed. Vainly we waited for the white flare that was the agreed signal that the others had fought their way into Volovo. Night came. We had waited seven hours. The last of us staggered to our feet under cover of darkness but promptly fell down because our feet couldn't carry us. Some vomited. We crawled and staggered forward until the blood began to circulate again. Then we were ordered to retire and under fire from Katyusha rockets we made our way back to Nikolausdorf hoping for sleep and warmth. But once again the Cossacks galloped up after midnight, hid their horses unremarked in the gully, and attacked the outer houses of the village where the aid station was. The sentries fled, and the wounded were murdered by the Siberian troops. We were roused by the alarm. Half-dressed soldiers, men in their shirts, in socks, barefoot, rushed past us in terror. A full moon lit their frantic, mindless flight, a medic collected together a score of men who stayed behind with us. We were armed with rifles, a bazooka and pistols. The expanse of the plain lay open in front of us, in the ghostly light of the moon, and across it charged the Cossacks with their wild urra, like a band of ghosts toward our group. In the fire of our rifles and our one gun, an attack of some four hundred Russians faltered. The survivors withdrew, but before we knew what was happening, they had outflanked us. We were surrounded. Hand grenades went up in our midst. Several men fell, wallowed about on the snow with ripped open bellies, got themselves tangled up in their own intestines. We broke up into smaller groups and laid into the drunken attackers with rifle butts. Two of us were slit apart by bayonet thrusts. In pairs we stood by the corner of a barn, the medic still with us, while ten feet in front of us the Russians oozed up out of the night like phantoms of death. My comrade fell. I lay in the snow and didn't shoot. It wasn't that my rifle was jammed, but at that time I was unable to shoot at men who were trying to kill me. I would sooner have died. 
That was the only hour of trial by fire in that winter campaign. The doctor, meanwhile, was potting attackers with his pistol. The last of them melted away. We could still hear the chilling urra in the distance. The next time they charged across the plain, several of us fled. The Russians surged past us and gave chase, and they didn't come back. We seven survivors were left alone for a long time. The ordeal was over. All through that night, fugitives kept returning. Men who had hidden somewhere or kept running, and at their wits' ends now came back without knowing whether the Russians had taken the village or not. St Nicholas's Day. Most had fresh frostbite. Wounded men dragged themselves along. We kept watch among the corpses. The fat face of the moon stared down on the corpses in the snow. Contorted features, calm faces, dull staring eyes, smashed skulls, slit bellies, squirts of blood and brains came to light as day broke. We went around ashen-faced, like dead men. Then, almost without a fight, we marched into Volovo, demanding food, warmth, sleep. The buildings were partly on fire. Katyusha rockets were being fired at us. But we found only a few isolated Red Army soldiers in the buildings. They were shot. An order had been given not to take any prisoners. In one house we came upon some hot noodle soup, which the Russians had simply left. We sat down on the benches, propped our freezing feet on the bodies, and ate hungrily, without thinking about death and danger. In the pockets of the dead we found bread and sugar, and we ate our fill. We weren't fastidious any more. In the evening there was an agitated command to leave right away. We had to try to slip the noose that a vast preponderance of Russian forces had almost drawn around us. The march back began without our having gotten any sleep. Mute, in an unexpressed despair, just like the beginning of this tragedy of an ambitious advance into no man's land. The moonlight shone down on the silent column of fugitives slowly making their way through the snow, reeling, slithering, stumbling westward. Ahead of us was uncertainty, perhaps no man's land, perhaps the enemy, behind us certainly, the pursuing Russians. We were dog-tired on this third night without sleep, if there was a delay anywhere of a few minutes, we would already be leaning against the guns asleep till the horses began to pull and we lurched awake. Then a swarm of men in camouflage dress surged toward us. Within seconds we had our machine gun set up, lashing bursts into the group. Some fell. The first of them were in front of us, German steel helmets, our own. There hadn't been many dead. We piled the worst of the wounded on carts and they died on the way. No one bothered about the bodies. We staggered on. Even as we marched, we were overmanned by sleep. Our eyes closed, our legs went mechanically on. Then our knees went, and we keeled over, awakened by pain, by the fall, pulled ourselves together, knelt, someone helped us to our feet, and with the last strength lent us by the fear of death, we tottered on. Any rest spelled death, we were told. The Russians are coming. That call worked like the crack of a whip, on. Silent, in despair, bitter, dull-witted, ghostly, we hurried westward like shades. We radioed for help, but no one could help us where we were. Several more men collapsed. They refused to get up and stayed where they lay. We kicked out at them, prodded them with rifles. Unhappily, with empty eyes, they got up and marched on. Whoever was at the rear received no such assistance. He would freeze or be found and beaten to death. Finally, there was a rest period. One hour. It was in a tiny village. Along with many other soldiers, I slunk into a house and collapsed in a corner. I was asleep before I touched the floor. When I awoke, I was all alone. I'd been forgotten about, but my strength had returned. I slipped off the safety catch on my rifle and dashed outside. There was no one neither friend nor foe. I hurried up a hill and there saw my comrades in the distance, tiny dots in the snowscape. I set off after them. Hours went by and then I caught up with them. My guardian angel hadn't abandoned me. Russian planes bombed and strafed us. 
but at noon we rested in hard, dry winter sunlight in a village on the Kshen and slept. It began to thaw. Our fighters and bombers smashed the ring, pounded the Russian troop concentrations. We greeted them with shouts of jubilation, tears in our eyes. Saved, provisionally, conditionally saved. Mercy for a while. Our advent began. The retreat faltered. We had no maps and didn't know the roads and the terrain. We had intended to winter behind the line of the River Tim, but we weren't there yet. We moved into another village, and that same night we received an order for twenty of us and a bazooka to come to the aid of a beleaguered outpost. The outpost was nineteen in a railway crossing cottage, on the line from Livni to Kursk, situated three and four kilometres respectively from the nearest village and pillbox to the north and south of us. We had our anti-tank gun, two heavy and three light machine guns, and plenty of ammunition. We slept on hay spread over boxes of bullets and grenades. We had a stove for warmth and a rifle oil lamp for light, but that was pretty much all we had. We burned the fencing and finally the flooring. For twelve days we lived on potatoes, which we boiled with a little salt. We found some green macorca to smoke, or we made do with hay. We drank snowmelt. There was no soap, and each of us had just one thin blanket. Tangled hair and beards, black hands, and most of us either festering and frostbitten or eaten alive by lice, scabies, and the inflammations on our legs. When we went out to do sentry duty, we wrapped ourselves in our threadbare blankets, but our icy feet drove tears of pain and rage to our eyes. Over two days and three nights we were under continuous attack from the Russians, shelled by their artillery or their infantry loomed up out of the fog, where either we killed them or they melted back into the night. Storm artillery afforded us some relief, but the lightly wounded had to stay where they were. Eleven men died or were badly wounded, three more lightly, Two went over to the Russians, and one mutilated himself. Of thirty men in all, the gun had no more ammunition, and the machine guns had to economise. A concerted attack would have spelled the end of us, and we couldn't understand the enemy. Our doomed clutch of men melted away. Advent for the doomed. We had to bear it. How we got through, no one bothered to ask. Our conversations revolved around relief, the perpetual delusion and around home and flight. Bitterly we contemplated hunger, cold, need, and our disappearing position. We were all sick and irritable. Outbursts of rage and hate, envy, fistfights, sarcasm and mockery stood in for whatever might have remained of comradeship. Even if no one talked about danger and proximity of death any more, they were still there. We didn't attend to our dead and didn't bury them either, just put on their coats and gloves. Things and values changed. Money had become meaningless. We used paper money for rolling cigarettes or gambled it away indifferently. Several got so far into debt that they couldn't pay with a year of their soldiers' wages, and that wouldn't be called in either. A piece of bread, though, was a fantasy that could not possibly be realised. But that too was part of the war. Death brought with it a limitless desire for sleep and oblivion. Only a few sought intimacy, most drugged themselves with superficialities, with gambling, cruelty, hatred, or they masturbated. This between fighting. One night I was on sentry duty and saw the village burning in the distance. The snowfields were under fog. Then I saw a long line of Russians crossing the railway line, silhouetted against the fire, vague shapes in the night and fog. I couldn't raise the alarm or fire at them. The eerie spectacle captivated and silenced me. By the time someone else woke those within, they had already moved on. Departure on Christmas Eve, as it got light. On the way we torched all the villages we passed through and blew up the stoves. We had been ordered to spread devastation so that our pursuers could find no shelter. We obeyed, and our self-loathing overpowered even our joy at being released. Women wailed, children froze in the snow, and curses followed us. Soon we stopped asking. When we were issued a supply of cigarettes, we lit them at the burning houses. Then we marched dully and feebly on our way, 
holding on to the carts, and reached Arinoch, a village on the River Tim. The new year began. Advent continued. There was nothing beyond the barest self-preservation. That was all that got us through so much cold and so many marches and sleepless nights. Never had I sensed and affirmed the will to live so strongly as now. Life was a balancing act, a rope suspended over death. Sometimes we were befallen by a kind of crying without tears. Arinoch on the River Tim at the beginning of the year we experienced the lowest temperatures of the entire winter campaign. We had to post sentries and spell each other every half hour. Our house was a long way from the last street. It was almost by the river. In front of us the plains stretched away with occasional sparse cover. Day and night we got no rest, even if the Russians weren't attacking us. One sentry who collapsed in a haystack and carried on sleeping was court-martialed and shot. Another was unable to find the unit to which he was taking a message in the darkness and was sentenced to death for cowardice in the face of the enemy. Whoever stole food, even a piece of bread, was executed for looting. It was a tense time. Prisoners of war dangled off the trees all around as a result of a command that was intended to frighten off the Russians. The war had become insane. It was all murder, never mind whom it affected. Rebellion was discouraged by fear of the enemy, who could no more be bothered with prisoners. There was little food, and the bad quarters couldn't get warm. Our existence was one long complaint against the war, but no god took us under his wing. The couple of hours' rest we got at a time we spent sleeping on the stove. Lice multiplied, and the dirt and disease increased. No one avoided pyoderma and lymph inflammations but only those who were already suffering from bone caries were sent to the hospital. Frostbite festered and stank in the heat of the stove. There was no lint. The same bandage, pus encrusted and stiff with scabs and rotted flesh, was used again and again. We had to go easy on salves and ointments. Some had long rags of blackened flesh hanging off their feet. It was snipped off. The bones were exposed, but with their feet wrapped in cloths and sacking, the men had to go on standing sentry and fighting. We had no winter clothing and never really got warm. Our perpetually cold feet hurt. Every footfall hurt, but we had to walk and move around. Frostbite could be interpreted as attempted self-mutilation. Our chilled guts couldn't deal with food. Everyone had diarrhoea, and some had diphtheria. One was so enfeebled that he broke down on his way to the doctor and froze to death. Older men developed rheumatism and often screamed with pain, but we couldn't let anyone go. I got lumbago and was moved back to the second village street, referred to as the support line. There I lay three days and nights on a stove, unable to sleep for pain. The following night I heard shots and cries, the urra of the Russians, and I crept out on all fours. The fighting went on for four hours. I sat in the house and wondered what was going to happen. I didn't care either way. Fleeing soldiers came in. They held their hands against the stove and rubbed their feet with snow to avoid frostbite at the very last moment. They propped me up until my limbs relaxed and I was able to walk again. We fled to Dubrovka. We left our cannons behind and threw away our machine guns. We left our blankets, bread sacks, mess tins, water bottles, and the recently arrived Christmas mail to the victors. Dubrovka. We moved into new positions. A house with snowbanks in front of it and some straw was our strong point. On our flight there, we ran into a fighting unit that had been on the run for a long time and had only just joined our lines again. They had a few men and hardly rested. Some of them now turned around. They found their missing in the ruins of a village. They had fallen asleep in the snow and frozen to death. Others had crept into stoves and with their frozen limbs were unable to get out. The stoves had to be smashed up and the lamenting casualties loaded on sleighs. In the field hospitals their arms and legs were amputated and they died in the course of the operations. It was garrison warfare. The front, such as it was, was a chain of widely separated villages. The Russians were able to march through in between us and pressed forward as far as Chigri. 
We didn't know. We found food. There were potatoes in cellars and bunkers, and we slaughtered sheep and cattle. But when the daily ration was four slices of bread, potatoes and slaughtering were banned, so as to build up a stock of provisions for the flood season ahead. We went on starving, and our guts and bellies didn't heal. Every day there were several hours of duty in the open, weapon cleaning also, but we had to collect our own wood and provisions. We waited a month for mail. The Russians attacked Dubrovka. They came at night. We put up no resistance because fighting, sacrifice and war, none of it mattered any more. A remnant of us fled across the plain to Belaya. Tanks approached us. We tied camouflage tunics to our rifles, swung them about and surrendered. But they were German tanks. We were forced to climb aboard. We rode back to Dubrovka, retook it, and the Russians suffered heavy casualties. Another group of refugees was targeted by our artillery and suffered losses. Our quarters were wrecked, and there were corpses littered about everywhere. We covered the German dead with tarpaulins. With the Cossacks we took off their felt boots and caps, as well as their pants and underpants, and put them on. We now moved closer together in the few houses still standing. One soldier had been unable to find any felt boots, which were an excellent protection against the cold. The next day he found a Red Army corpse frozen stiff. He tugged at his legs, but in vain. He grabbed an axe and took the man off at the thighs. Fragments of flesh flew everywhere. He bundled the two stumps under his arm and set them down in the oven next to our lunch. By the time the potatoes were done, the legs were thawed out and he pulled on the bloody felt boots. Having the dead meat next to our food bothered us as little as if someone had wrapped his frostbite between meals or cracked lice. The dead lay where they lay. After weeks they were collected on sleighs, piled up in ruined houses along with horse cadavers, doused with gasoline and lit. Otherwise every day passed in the same way, in the drab monotony of sentry duty, scraps of sleep, worries about food and fuel, and the other duties we had to do. We had grown poor. Finally blankets started to arrive in ones and twos and other essential equipment. I was crazy with homesickness and fatigue, and standing sentry in the terrible cold, I suffered a nervous collapse, fired at shadows, and ended up being found exhausted and unconscious in the blizzard by the man who relieved me. Saved. After that crisis, I quickly got better and recovered my confidence and will to live. The horror that clung on to despair and exalted itself into a cynical heroical yes, this demented affirmation of doom. That was the greatness of the men in Russia and the suicide of the soul. We stood guard over the Dubrovka Gorge, looking like ghosts, midway between corpses and hanged men. The moon was crescent, the cold was preparing for one final assault, but the enemy was quiet. I wanted to forget, to forget everything merely in order to remain human. In that spirit, I wrote everything down in my diaries, in order to slough it off and shed it for good. It didn't work. I had gotten to know only one side of Russia, the ruined churches and wintertime, and yet I believed that this war had to be, to prepare for some future as yet unknown, and I lost myself in bizarre fantasies. My purulent legs made me unfit to serve, I was driven back to the supply column and received treatment there. That was the end of the winter campaign so far as I was concerned. I had been saved at the last moment, but I was lost. Return home fate did with me as it pleased. I understood how little I was able to affect it by anything I thought or did, and reserved the freedom to give of my best only when things were at their worst. But I lived on the edge. Death the blind strangler had failed to find me, but a human being had died in Russia, and I didn't know who it was. Thinking despairing thoughts, I lay on the pallet, my purulent legs swollen and braced. I was in safety with the supply column, yet I was unhappier than ever. I was in pain. I didn't get better, and after the third inspection the doctor sent me to the hospital. I packed together my last few things, a wooden spoon, a Russian knife, and the bread sack of a dead Cossack, and was taken on a sleigh to the principal aid station, 
was bandaged up and was sent to a house to spend the night. A heavily wounded man was delivered, unconscious, with shrapnel in his chest and head. He had been supposed dead, and was bandaged only after lying out in the frost for several hours. It was too late. He lay groaning on the thin straw. His hands, brown with frozen blood, were scratching away at his bandage, making jerky movements in shadows and candlelight. I sat down beside him and took his restless, desperate hands in mine. It was a struggle against his blind, unconscious energies. Once he broke loose and stared at me with sightless eyes. His ghostly hand gestured at my chest, as if blaming me for his suffering and death. Horror gripped me, and he fell back and died. But I couldn't find any rest. I kept seeing his accusing hand, the appalled eyes of the dying man staring at me. I was a soldier too, and so partly responsible for his plight. At daybreak a sleigh transported me to the nearest aid station, a cold, gloomy building where casualties writhed like helpless worms on the thin straw. Valinian fever. Their groans and cries blew through my dreams. I got up and went outside. The night wind sang in the trees. The fact that I was sick and was allowed to sleep felt like a comfort. All I wanted was to rest. Soon my fate summoned me back to suffering and action, driven by sleigh to Malo Arkhangelsk. Under several blankets we lay in harsh frost and froze, on by truck to Poniri, then joined a Russian hospital train. A coal fire glowed, the others told their stories. I lay there, half asleep, wholly apathetic, and allowed everything to be done to me. I was just a shuttlecock of the powers. At Oral Station there was another train waiting. We boarded that. I sat in the compartment blankly. When I heard this one was going as far as Warsaw, I wept. Day after day, night after night, the train trundled through the white winterland. Bryansk, Smolensk, Minsk, steps home. In Ostroleka Mazowieckie, 21, we were taken off and joined a casualty clearing station. We were deloused, bathed, given fresh clothes, and suddenly found ourselves lying in white cotton sheets, no longer having to freeze, to starve, to go out on sentry duty. We could sleep, were tended, and we couldn't understand it. It was like a dream. We had supposed there was only ice and snow in the world, and in a sudden fear of anything kind and beautiful, found ourselves assailed by homesickness for Russia. We longed for the white winter hell, for pain, privation, danger. We didn't know what else to do with our lives. We were afraid to be home and now understood what the war had done to our souls. I was able to sleep, yet stayed awake far into the night, listening to music on the radio and letting the past months pass in review. Half a year that felt like several decades worth. Once more I experienced dreamlike visions of the attack on Stigri and the flight from Volovo of Advent and the Winter War.